and let us all that we can to build a better future. So Max Blumenthal uh, once again just gave a firm smack to the face of the State Department. So I got two videos back to back of the State Department, uh, well, just being twisted into a pretzel. It's, it's, it's quite hilarious in a way. So I'm not going to pause for Max Blumenthal's video because I think it's important for us to hear his questions and how the State Department is just a struggling. So let's go ahead and play this video. Shout out to the Gray Zone. Shout out to Max Blumenthal, who's, an, again, an award-winning journalist. They've done fantastic work. Let's play this video in its full entirety for everyone to enjoy. And how crazy is it that the State Department was not ready? I mean, when, when Max comes in, comes into that room, this this dude right here, this 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 little guy here, he's he's probably shaking in his boots. He's he's afraid. He's afraid. And in March 2021, Secretary Blinken accused China of the crime of genocide for its alleged treatment of the Uyghur minority, but he didn't accuse them of killing on any mass scale or force forcible transfer. Now we see with Israel's military assault on Gaza, something like one out of two every 200 people in the Gaza Strip has been eliminated. Over 4,000 children killed. The Ministry of Intelligence, as Sam pointed out, in Israel has published a blueprint for the forced transfer of the entire Palestinian population to Egypt. We have the intent to commit genocide expressed at the highest level of the Israeli government, including Netanyahu himself referring to the Palestinian population as Amalek, the biblical Amalek. So I wonder, you know, when, you, when you're accusing one country of genocide without accusing them of mass killing, and then blocking ceasefires to enable another country's military assault. What metric are you using to determine genocide, or is this just political rhetoric? It's certainly not political rhetoric. Uh, the department, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday, we have a rigorous process uh, in place for evaluating whether something constitute as genocide or not. And that is true in any country that uh, that situation might be being looked at. Uh, that is not a term that we have assessed pertains to this current conflict. We are, of course, monitoring the evolving situation and are examining facts as they develop. Uh, this continues to be um, uh, an incredibly uh, challenging uh, and, and fraught situation, but it's also important to remember that Hamas bears responsibility for sparking this war. Uh, they have brought this tragic war uh, to Gaza. Okay, well, President Biden is... A very interesting response from the State Department. Now, Max is going to be coming back with a few other gut checks. And I'm seeing in the live stream chat, and I just have to quote this in its full in its full quote here. And more or less, most of you have been saying it. The State Department's probably wondering, who let a journalist in the room here? We don't have our CNN and MSNBC puppets. He's accused the Russian government of genocide for its actions in Ukraine, where in two years... It has killed as many civilians as Israel. Oh, and, and by the way, hold on. I'm going to rewind that. But real quick here, um, that was also one hell of a word salad. Just had to throw that out there. President Biden has accused the Russian government of genocide for its actions in Ukraine, where in two years it has killed as many civilians as Israel has killed in one month in the Gaza Strip. So how do you account for that disparity where you're assisting one country and accusing the other of genocide when one the country you're assisting has systematically killed so many more people in one month. Those circumstances are totally and completely uh, not the same. And to make a comparison like that, candidly, is um, incredibly uh, uh, inappropriate. It's inappropriate. But here, this guy's going to give another word salad. It's inappropriate. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you, Max Blumenthal, ask me questions that trigger me or make me feel sad? We have been, please don't, please don't interrupt me. We have. How been, dare you? Uh, we uh, have raised directly with uh, the Israeli government about the need to uh, distinguish between Hamas terrorists and uh, Palestinian civilians. Uh, this is something that the secretary has raised directly on his travels. He, uh, we even laid out that we believe that there are um commitments that can be made additionally on dealing with protecting civilian life more effectively. Uh, and we're watching very closely to, to, to make sure that happens. So if you refer to Palestinian civilians as human shields, doesn't that blur the distinction but between civilians and militants? I, I am not, we have not referred to Palestinian civilians as human shields. We have said, we have said, we have said that Hamas, 
this man doesn't know what to do. He, I, I, I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet this 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 dude easily got pushed around in school or lost, got got lost in the hallways here and there because he just couldn't stand up for himself. He he doesn't really know how to put together a statement because Max is going to be coming at him with the facts pretty soon. Moss is using Palestinian civilians as human shields. That is, that, not, be... that is not hyperbole. That is something that we have seen Hamas do as they continue to uh, integrate themselves into key civilian infrastructure across Gaza. Wouldn't that be blurring the distinction between civilians and combatants? If you say Hamas is using civilians as human shields, wouldn't that be in some ways justifying the killing of civilians because they happen to be we, in the we way, are not in justifying we are there is no one in this administration that is justifying um killing of civilians any civilian life loss uh is incredibly troubling heartbreaking to us any number above zero is deeply troubling to us what we are doing is we are working with our israeli partners to ensure that steps can be taken to minimize the impact on civilian life. And we also have uh, believe that there is a moral imperative, there is a strategic imperative to take steps to minimize uh, loss of civilian life. It's just, it, it, it hasn't reached a big number. It's only what, at 10,000 now? Between eight and 10,000? That number is going to get higher, and the Biden Harris administration is doing nothing to lift a finger. Hospitals and schools and refugee centers are being bombed, and all of this all of this guy can do is give out word salads. But hold on, hold on, hold on. I got another video because this also took place during the same meeting as well. And I think it or this is the same individual who's also had his feet to the fire. Uh, let's go ahead and play this video here. Sam, go ahead. Thank you. President Lula of Brazil uh, recently joined a growing list of world leaders condemning Israel, not just simply for war crimes, not just simply for crimes against humanity, but for genocide. The late president of the Center for Constitutional Rights, Michael Ratner, uh, during Israel's 2014 assault on Gaza, which killed 2,000 Palestinians, advocated that the Genocide Convention be invoked in that case against Israel, saying that legally for genocide, quote, you don't need to kill all of them. You just need to have the mental intent to kill part of them. Greg Mokhyber, who just resigned as director of the New York office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, noted that intent, usually the hardest part of genocide to prove, isn't in this case. He's, he wrote in his resignation letter, quote, explicit statements of intent by leaders in the Israeli government and military leave no room for doubt or debate. Um, finally, Francis Boyle, who successfully prosecuted who successfully represented Bosnia and Herzegovina in their genocide case against Yugoslavia before the International Court of Justice, has similarly argued that the Palestinians or any other signer to the Genocide Convention should immediately instigate a, initiate a uh, emergency legal process invoking the convention at the International Court of Justice, yet no government has done so. Um, my you question to you, in? my question to you, is has the U.S. government pressured or bribed or threatened in any way, shape, or form Abbas, the people around him, institutions around him, from invoking this or any other legal mechanisms against Israel to stop its attack? Um, I don't even know where to start there, Sam. Um, uh, no, the U.S. has not been involved in uh, uh, pressuring or uh, anything like that to any officials uh, within uh, the Palestinian Authority. I, I I just like the counter imagery right here, the counter headlines, calling out the State Department. Just it's 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 just, it's, it's an interesting perspective, a point of view. Uh, what I will just say again in the context of this conflict, we have been incredibly clear that as Israel defend itself and defends its security, that it is imperative that it continues to make a distinction between Hamas terrorists and Palestinian civilians, and that's something we'll continue to raise uh, directly with uh, Israeli counterparts. I will also note that we, uh, within the U.S. government, have a rigorous process for evaluating whether something constitutes uh, genocide, and we have not made uh, that assessment in this case. Uh, and it's really important to remember that Hamas uh, bears responsibility for sparking this war, uh, and they brought this tragic war to Gaza. They. Uh... I just want to pause here for a second. 
Okay. I, I do call into question just what happened on October 7th. Just and look, I, I, to be clear here, sometimes people get caught off guard. Sometimes you see you, you you get a right hook to the face that you didn't see coming. You know, that's why I always say keep your head on a swivel. But it is always interesting to see what was happening before October 7th, the political and domestic turmoil that Prime Minister Netanyahu was dealing with. Because his own government was having concerns and issues with his leadership. And then October 7th come and no oh, crisis. Emergency powers, we're at war. Who knows if a stand on order was given or not, or just, hey, people were just told to relax, but somehow, oh, miraculously out of the blue, oh, there's this crisis to uh, cause a distraction for any kind of local domestic issues, things taking place that, you know, people will ignore. Because I, I've said this before, that the internet has this thing called the blurring effect. So I want to just go ahead and play this video again. Let's go ahead and play the rest of this video. If I, if I might, I didn't interrupt you. I didn't interrupt you. The Center for Constitutional Rights just put out a statement. Legal organizations put members of Congress on notice for complicity on genocide. Quote, please take note. This is a letter that they sent to members of Congress, Center for Constitutional Rights. Please take notice that should you vote in favor of that package, the Biden package for Israel, you risk facing criminal and civil liabilities for aiding and abetting genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity under international law, and may face investigation and prosecution. Do members of the State Department face similar possibilities? Again, uh, Sam, as I said, we have uh, the U.S. government has a, a rigorous process in place for evaluating whether something constitutes a rigorous process. But here's what's happening. Let's talk about that process. This is taking place right now. Shout out to Case Study QB. Israel may oversee Gaza for an indefinite period of time. What Say it with me, folks, and especially in the back. What could possibly go wrong? The Israeli military says its troops will comb through every inch of Gaza. They've surrounded Gaza City. And Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu says Israel may occupy Gaza for a period until a replacement for Hamas can be found. He spoke to ABC News. I think Israel will, for a, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility because we've seen what happens when we don't have it. President Biden has said an occupation would be a mistake. Taking over Gaza, defeating Hamas, and finding local Palestinians to work with could take years. And as US troops learned in Iraq, could easily fail and devolve into a long and bloody insurgency. Blowing up schools, residential homes, hospitals, closing the borders, uh, denying any kind of food or aid. What what could go wrong? Plus 75 years, 75 years of uh, tall concrete walls, barbed wires, watchtowers, lack of anything that could that could you know, make a city productive, of course people are going to be upset. You think they're going to like being stepped on all the time? No, people will push back. Gaza could be far more violent than Iraq. Most Iraqis never believed American troops were coming to drive them from their homes for good. Many Palestinians believe that's Israel's goal. Believe, hey, BSD and C... I don't know if you've been paying attention to the maps, especially from the 1940s up until now of Israel and Palestine. But uh, a, a shocking thing will happen if you click that fast forward button. You'll notice all the land that belonged to the Palestinians being consumed and taken away. Gaza being turned into an open air prison. You know, the West Bank. More uh, homes are being built. The original inhabitants, farms are being destroyed. You know, when Bassem Youssef was being interviewed for the second time by Pierce Morgan, Bassem mentioned uh, the olive trees and how some of them are 600 years old. 600 years old. Think about the stories that those olive trees might have witnessed in their time. The events that took around them. Yeah, of course. Yes, yes, it's an olive tree, but 600 years old. 800,000 have been upended and rooted, destroyed forever. On the West Bank. Forever destroyed. Never to be seen again. Those miracles of nature. 
it is understandable why the Palestinian people would think, yeah, they're, they're, they're coming in to kick us out of our homes. Because it's been done before. It's been done before. This, is, this isn't an opinion. This isn't just some random statement. It's a goddamn fact. And how do you control an area that Israeli airstrikes are increasingly turning to rubble? Our crew this morning. To quote the Joker, it's all part of the plan from the Dark Knight. You know, if the Joker went live on air right now and said that a gangbanger was going to get shot or a truck full of soldiers was going to get blown up or a hospital was going to be hit by a tactical airstrike, nobody's going to panic. If I were to tell you that a financial institution such as a bank or some sort of hedge fund was going belly up and that Congress was going to bail them out, nobody's going to panic. It's all part of the plan. It's all chaos, and it's because of the system we are in. It's horrific, but nobody's panicking. So it is understandable why the Palestinian people are thinking that they're going to be removed from their homes. Their grandparents went through it. Their parents went through it. They're going through it, and their children will go through it, and their grandchildren will go through it followed a rescue team in southern Gaza, where Israel has told Palestinians to go for safety. They managed to pull out two girls, cutting and digging through debris for hours. Both of them are named Amal. Yael Shoham is also trapped in Gaza. She's three years old and was kidnapped with her family by Hamas on October 7th from Kibbutz Beri. I met her uncle, Yuval. Are all these people from your family? This is my family. We're talking about a little girl who was, who was never away from her mother. They are always together. They sleep together. And I don't even know if Adiz is hugging her now. We don't know if they have food. We don't know if they have water. We don't know if they're together. I can't think about what's happening in Gaza because it, it breaks my heart. And unfortunately, this war will be eternal. We are dealing here with a system that is systematically designed to keep this inhumanity functioning. It helps out the war profiteering. It helps out all big financial institutions. And a lot of governments are part of it. It's just, you know, it's it's easy to look at the United States government and our corruption. But this is a game that's played by a lot of governments. They like to play this game. And guess, guess who are the pieces? Us, the people. You know, a, a whole institution worldwide has been built of media and political establishments and financial institutions that keep us against each other, divided. It's it's a horrible plan, and a lot of us have been indoctrinated into being part of it. A lot of us have been hypnotized in believing that this is okay, that this is acceptable. It is what it is. Shout out to Max Blumenthal, who is at least one of the few reporters, journalists out there, that are actually speaking truth to power. That's actually shining a light on the corruption and the abuse that's happening. Because we don't have a media that's telling us what's going on. And we have a political establishment that has profited off of this system that's sucking away all the hope and humanity from us. Sooner or later, it has to end. And we need people to speak truth to power. And this is why we need independent media. So shout out to Max Blumenthal who's been unapologetic, who's been right with his factual reporting. People like Aaron Maté and everyone else who's part of the gray zone as well. Don't stop. Because we people are waking up to it. People are upset. Not enough people are waking up to it. But maybe enough will cause this system to end. Maybe there could be a chance. But the first step is recognizing the root cause, and that is corporate media, the political establishment system, and those that benefit of keeping us divided.